Welcome back, friends, to Music Therapy and Beyond. I'm Kristen, and I'm here again today for our first episode in February, the segment we like to call our learning segment, where we dig into research to learn more about a topic. As it is February, it seems only appropriate to ask the question, why do we love music? Now, subjectively, we know music affects us. Simply Google music quotes, and you'll find a plethora of examples. Where words fail, music speaks. Sometimes music is the only medicine the heart and soul need. Music is life. That's why our heart beats. As well as a known quote attributed to Beethoven, music can change the world. These are but a few examples of the overwhelming proof that we humans are intrinsically linked and affected by music. But is that supported in research? And if so, why does that matter in the field of music therapy? So let's learn together about this topic, but before we do that, a friendly reminder that all the resources can be found in the episode details wherever you listen and on our website at www.musictherapyandbeyond.com. Now, let's answer the question, why do we love music? First, let's start with a few definitions. Love, according to Oxford languages, is an intense feeling of deep affection or great interest and pleasure in something. Music is defined as vocal or instrumental sounds, or both, combined in such a way as to produce beauty of form, harmony, and expression. Scientifically, we are going to refer to music as a pattern or sequence of sounds within our discussion today. In his article, Why Do We Love Music?, neuroscientist Robert Zetara, Ph.D., begins with this editorial, in quotes, While the human brain is hardwired to feel pleasure for basic survival necessities such as eating and sex, music, although obviously pleasurable, doesn't offer the same evolutionary advantages. So why do we respond to the patterns of sound that disappear in an instant? Why do we belt music from the top of our lungs, learn to play instruments, and empty our bank accounts to see Bruce Springsteen on Broadway? End quotes. Why indeed do we love music? On the surface, music doesn't serve a survival or functional need, so why do we seem to receive such pleasure from it? We also know from experience that we all respond to music differently. What music we like and dislike are not the same. So how does that play into this question? And why do we love music since the music we love is not the same? When speaking about music and pleasure, Dr. Zadera and his colleagues suggest a direct link between the auditory and perception systems in our brains. Without digging too deep into the neuronal areas, these are a few that are in play in this discussion, those being the auditory, frontal, and subcortical regions. When speaking specifically about perception and predictions and expectations with regards to music, the interplay is thought to originate in the auditory and frontal regions and that the link between those two, frontal regions being where many of our executive functions are housed. In this article, they identified the deep subcortical region, specifically the striatum, as the heart of the pleasure or reward response. This region is known to release dopamine, the pleasure hormone, in response to food, erotic stimuli, winning money in gambling, playing video games, and yes, listening to highly pleasurable music. This process, also known as the reward system, is activated in response to the level of congruency with our neurologic predictions and developed expectations from our perceptions and past experiences. So to dig a little bit deeper into this, we need to understand that hearing these sequence and patterns of sounds, which we're also defining as music, are not rewarding in and of themselves. 
It is this predictions and expectations our brains create around these patterns of sound that elicit this response or this response of pleasure is what we're talking about, that reward system where we have this incredible spike of the dopamine um, from those subcortical regions. The This is what makes us feel elated and what makes us feel um, pleasure when we listen to these sounds. So it's within this reward system. In this article, Zadara and colleagues detail a reward prediction model where the reward response is greatest neither when the outcome is exactly as expected, which they refer to as boring, nor when the outcome is completely unpredictable, which is confusing, but when it hits the sweet spot of being somehow better than expected. So when our expectations are met, that is perceived as boring. When our expectations are, com- it's completely unpredictable and we cannot make any predictions, it's confusing. But when it hits the sweet spot of being just a little bit better than what we expected. Before we look at how this plays out in our own lives, it is important to know that these are expectations we develop throughout our life, beginning early in development. Our expectations around sound and patterns of sound or music are developed over time as our brains anticipate future events based on past experiences. So that's how we get the predictions and expectations. It's our brains anticipating future events based on past experiences. So that has a lot to do with, you know, our previous exposure to music. That's a whole nother episode. We're not going to get into that today, but just know that that's where our expectations come from. And that's what we're speaking about today is our brains anticipating future events based on past experiences. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that we probably have seen this play out in our own lives. Certain songs or patterns of sound elicit a full body response with sometimes an increased heart rate feelings of elation, and even body chills. This is when we've experienced that sweet spot, where the music is somehow better than our neurologic expectations. In contrast, we likely also have experience with the opposite scenario, where music is either congruent with our neurologic expectations or completely unpredictable, and the music does not elicit the same response. We are either bored or confused. We've all probably experienced all three of these scenarios. And another observation that I think is really interesting surrounding the scenario where in which you find a song that hits that sweet spot. And what do we do? We binge it. You know exactly what I'm talking about. (laughs) You listen to it all the time, which consistently activates that reward system that triggers that hormone dopamine release, and we feel elated over the moon. We have this huge rush of pleasure and joy in response to that selection of music or a song. I can remember many instances of this in my own life where I physiologically responded and I was overwhelmed and I cry and I laugh and I dance and I hug. I love. We say, I love this song. I love this song. Take a moment here to step back into that memory that I dare say many, if not all of us, have experienced. These moments of pure joy are held in our memory because of music. But what happens when we binge that song too many times? Over time, we lose that feeling of elation when we hear the very same song that a few hundred plays prior, elicited a pleasure response. This lack of pleasure is response to the same song that used to elicit elation is in direct response to this link between the perceptions and predictions and expectations. So what we receive, how we perceive it, and then now the expectations are our response. We may even perceive that the same song now is boring 
Over time, our brain predicts the response and no longer is that pattern and sequence of sound somehow better than our expectations. The outcome is now exactly as we expect, which we now perceive as boring. So, now we know that music can elicit a physiological and neurological response, and that response is based on a series of processes between our auditory and perception systems. Humans are designed to create and respond to sound and patterns of sounds. Why do we love music? Well, because our brains and bodies are designed to receive, perceive, and respond to stimuli in our environment. And music, or a pattern of sound, are stimuli in our environment. It is as basic and complex as that. Research isn't completely clear around all aspects of the interplay between music and humans, which still holds a bit of a mystical nature, I think. But articles such as this help us at least understand why we perceive that we love music. As we wrap up here, it may be intuitive why this question is so important to the field of music therapy. As music therapists, we use music as a tool to help individuals live better lives. The importance of music preferences, which are developed through the auditory and perception process, are vitally important in the work that we do. Understanding that preferences can change over time and that the elements of music, tone and style, dynamics, rhythm, melody, harmony, are what interacts with the predictions and reward systems in our brains. This is essential information for us to know and to understand. This one example of how we receive, perceive, and respond to music opens up a plethora of possibilities within a music therapy session, as well as aspects to be cautious and concerned about when making music with others. Now, if we go back to that definition of love in the beginning, love is an intense feeling of deep affection or a great interest and pleasure in something. We are beautiful and complex beings, and yes, we do love music. For show notes and resources in today's episode and all episodes, head to our website, musictherapyandbeyond.com. Reach out to us at musictherapyandbeyond at gmail.com and follow us on social media to stay up to date on all the content and announcements. We'll see you next time. Thank you.